development lies between genes and the phenotype. So you have genes, they express, and then there's a process of development that takes place in, in building the organism and whatnot. And then you end up with the phenotype, the thing that you observe. So development is important. We, we, we must have affected development in some way when we did this selection. We selected for the amount of pollen stored in the comb, and we changed the frequencies of some specific genes that were measured by these QTL that I showed, the PLN1, 2, 3, 4. Those genes then in some way must have had some effect on the development of the individuals between egg and adult that was then affecting their sensory response systems that then affected the behavioral phenotype uh, that we measured. So here's a case, honey, queen and worker honeybees have the same genotype. There's no, there's no genes that say you're gonna be a queen versus a worker, they're the same. The difference between a queen and a worker uh, in, their, in their anatomy is based on, on uh, what they've been fed. It's purely environmental. Remember, phenotype equals genotype plus the environment. Well, here, the difference between this is all environment. It's what they've been fed. Uh, and the differences are, pro are really profound when you look at the ovaries. Queens have very large ovaries with lots of ovarials, an average of somewhere around 300 ov ovarials total. Uh, workers have much smaller over, their ovaries are spindly and there are only a few ovarials. So this is, this is more than 300 ovarials. Here it's typically two to four. For a, for a worker, the number of ovarios that a worker has. Big difference, and this is all based on what they've been, they've been fed. But workers are, can still reproduce. We call them facultatively sterile. sterile. Under certain conditions, environmental conditions, they're sterile. Under other environmental conditions, such as a colony that has no queen, then they become reproductive. They produce eggs, but they don't mate with males, so they have no sperm to contribute to those eggs. So those eggs are unfertilized and they develop into males. And this is called haplodiploidy. And that's it's something, it's a trait that actually occurs across about 20% of all insect species are haplodiploid, where males are derived parthenogenically from unfertilized eggs. Ovaries affect behavior. Take a look around you. I mean, virtually every uh, all of the higher organisms that have ovaries, uh, the ovaries and ovarial cycles of egg production affect behavior from humans to turtles. Um, in honeybees, we think that the, the ovaries are affecting behavior, foraging behavior, and we call that a reproductive ground plan hypothesis. The idea is, is that solitary in, uh, bee species Individual females will go out and they'll per perhaps uh, burrow in the ground and make a nest or, or a, a, a nest that has cells. So here's a cell in a, in a ground burrowing, solitary um, uh, bee species. She then goes out and collects protein, the pollen, and, pack, and packs it along with a little bit of nectar. And then she lays an egg on top of it. The egg hatches the larva consumes the pollen and it goes through its development and emerges as an adult. So this is part of a cycle of solitary insects, and solitary bees in this case. They, they, they have this cycle where the females, when their ovarials are developed, their ovaries are developed, they start foraging for protein resources uh, and, and they provision nests so that they can lay eggs and provide for their offspring. We look at it as a cycle. When individual um, solitary bees or, or other and lots of other insects such as as uh, mosquitoes uh, when they first emerge as adults they go through a phase of self maintenance they will collect nectar they'll start nectar collecting and and this is to to to, to get them tanked up with energy or whatever then their ovaries get activated so let's talk about mosquitoes so their their over ovaries get activated and now they change their behavior. The behavior switches from foraging on flowers to foraging on blood meals. So they will then start seeking out a host like you and me. 
uh, they'll collect the blood proteins that we have. And then once they get filled up with the blood proteins, their behavior changes again. They quit foraging for hosts to feed on. They start seeking places to hide. So you'll find them like in your bathroom after they've fed on you at night, they may be down behind the toilet in a dark place, dark moist place, and they sit there and they're processing eggs. So they're very inactive. Once their eggs get processed and they, and they have them ready to lay, then their behavior changes again and they go into an ovipositional behavior. So they go out, they start flying around looking for water on which they can lay their eggs on, on the surface of the water, which then hatch, they become wrigglers and, and feed, and then they become adults. After they laid their eggs, then they start over again. They, they go and they seek, a, uh, they seek nectar from the flowers and they re, refurbish themselves. And then they go again and, and select a, 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 a host to take a blood meal. Well, we can see the same thing going on with honey, with solitary bees. You know, they have a nectar and maintenance, um, uh, self-maintenance phase. Their ovaries become activated. They, they start foraging for pollen. Uh, and then they, they pack their cells and they uh, have ovipositional behavior where they lay their eggs. And then they go through this cycle. Okay, then, so we're, we're looking at this as a, as a master ground plan for reproduction in insects. This, this relationship between maintenance and nectar collecting versus reproduction and protein foraging like for pollen. So let's go back to um, ovaries and how they developed. Um, ovaries, uh, there, there's no difference in the genotypes of queens and workers. It's what they were fed. So how does that affect them? Well, queens get, get fed higher concentrations of, of, of um, sugar in the food that they're fed as larvae. This higher concentration of sugar that they get fed and results in them feeding more and also results in a, a, a spike, an increase in what we call juvenile hormone. Juvenile hormone is a, is a developmental hormone and also one that affects behavior. Um, and then there, there's larval stages that they go through. They go through five larval stages as they develop from egg to a pupa. Uh, during the third to the fifth larval stage, because they've been fed more sugar, they have an increase in juvenile hormone circulating in their blood. That increase in juvenile hormone rescues the ovarials from programmed cell death. So a worker and a queen have the same number of primordial um, ovarials uh, when they're larvae. So there's no difference. The queen with a higher level of juvenile hormone protects those developing ovarials from programmed cell death so that she ends up with more functional ovarials when she emerges as an adult. The worker larvae, the ones that are destined to be workers, they get fed lower concentrations of sugar during this critical window and, um, and feed less. And as a consequence, fewer of their ovarials are rescued from cell death. So this is a critical component to showing this, this difference in phenotype in, in between queens and workers. So if we go back to our high and low strain uh, ovaries that we looked at, um, we showed that the high strain bees have more highly activated ovaries. They're vitelogenic, they're absorbing vitelogen earlier in life. Uh, and if we, if we step back and start looking for a developmental signature of this, we go back to larval stages three to five. And what we find in fact is that low strain bees have less juvenile hormone circulating in their blood between the third and the fifth larval instar. Less juvenile hormone rescues fewer of their ovarials from apoptosis compared to high strain bees. High strain bees have more circulating, not as much as a queen, but more than, than a low strain bee, and they end up having, having more ovarials rescued from 
programmed cell death, which is also called apoptosis in this case. So we can talk about a reproductive regulatory network. Again, these things don't work by themselves. Um, the reproductive regulatory network uh, in the honeybee that we studied, the components consist of the ovaries uh, and ecdysteroids. These are, these are um, hormones like ecdysone that are produced in the ovaries and get released in the blood and act on the fat body. Fat body is a collection of cells uh, that, are that are located in the abdomen. The fat body cells are basically factories for a lot of things. The fat body cells produce vitelligenin. And vitelligenin produced in the fat body, after it's been signaled by the ovaries using ecdysteroids, the fat body produces vitelligenin, releases it into the, into the bloodstream, which then gets absorbed as eggs. And also, the vitelligenin has the effect of of suppressing juvenile hormone, keeps the juvenile hormone levels low. Remember, juvenile hormone is a, is a developmental hormone and also one that's involved in behavior. Critical in all of this is a, a kind of a double, called a double repressor feedback loop. Vitelligenin titers suppress juvenile hormone. Juvenile hormone titers suppress vitelligenin. So they're acting on each other to regulate their levels uh, in the bloodstream of, of bees. So you can look at the regulatory network this way. We have the corpora lata. These are paired uh, glands in the heads of bees. The corpora lata produce um, uh, juvenile hormone. And the juvenile hormone that they produce in the head of the bee acts on the ovaries. It, it activates the ovaries. It kind of prepares them for reproduction. And the ovaries then release ecdysteroids into the bloodstream, into the hemolymph of the, of the, the, the bee. And the ecdysteroids then act on the fat body, stimulates the production of vitelligenin, which then gets absorbed into the ovaries and made into eggs. But the vitelligenin also feeds back and inhibits juvenile hormone that's being produced in the, in, in the bee, or, or at least the, the juvenile hormone that's available in the, in the um, fat body of the bees. Uh, and so that by the ju juvenile hormone titers going down, it suppresses the, the inhibition that juvenile hormone has on the production of VG in the ovaries. And VG also is directly related to foraging behavior in that it's related to pollen versus nectar foraging decisions. So we have this network here that's working. So critical of that is this VG juvenile hormone feedback that goes on. So if you, if you reduce vitelligenin circulating in the blood, that's going to result in an increase in juvenile hormone because it won't be suppressed. As juvenile hormone titers go up, you get earlier initiation of foraging behavior. So if you increase juvenile hormone circulating, you get bees will forage earlier in life. And if you decrease vitelligenin levels, you'll result in an increase in juvenile hormone, earlier foraging in life, and the reduction in the vitelligenin levels acting on foraging behavior act, will reduce the, the bias for pollen collecting. We can inject double-stranded RNA. This is just pieces of, of, of RNA for a particular gene, in this case, vitelligenin. It, we we in, can inject this RNA into the fat body and, and we inject it into the hemolymph and then it gets incorporated into the fat body. And when it's incorporated into the fat body, it reduces the production of vitelligenin. So we can reduce the amount of vitelligenin circulating in the bloodstream using this double-stranded RNA knockdown technique, and we can study the effects. So what we expect is that when we inject it, it, the double-stranded RNA and it gets into the fat body, that it's going to reduce the amount of vitelligenin produced. If we reduce vitelligenin, we're going to have an effect on whether they forage for nectar or pollen when they initiate foraging, and we're going to have an effect on juvenile hormone 
which will affect the age at which they initiate foraging. And that's what we find out. When we look at the high strain bees in our wild and wild type bees that were not bees that we selected for the amount of pollen stored in the comb, what we find is, is when we knock down vitelogenin, we get an, see an increase in the amount of juvenile hormone, which we expect. We see an early onset of foraging behavior as a consequence of there being presumably an increase in, in juvenile hormone. We show a nectar foraging bias and an increased response to sugar when we do the, the proboscis extension reflex. So we knock down juvenile hormone, I mean, knock down vitelogenin, and we affect foraging behavior, the onset of foraging behavior, and what the bees will collect. We wanted to see how ovary size and this, this dual mechanism for, this mechanism for dual control of vitelogenin and juvenile hormone, where does it map? Is it part of our, is it part of our, our, our um, phenotypic architecture. It's definitely a part of the, of the phenotypic architecture. So we constructed more QTL maps. And what we showed in fact is that some of these same QTLs that we measured, PLN three and four specifically for, for, for the, the, the regu regulatory loop, uh, these were involved. They, they, they mapped to the same place. So all these behavioral traits and the ovary size and this regulatory process basically all linked, to, all were uh, linked to the same traits. So we have a genetic architecture that's affecting a phenotypic architecture that involves all these traits um, that we've been able to, to, to map.